Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Reinventing Greatness, Interviews with Inspiring Leaders. I'm Sherry Goodwin, and I'm so excited to have my good friend, Marianne Clyde, here with us this morning. And I will introduce her in a moment, but hello, Marianne, and welcome. I'm there. So good to be here. Oh, it's great to see you. So the, I'm a business strategist, leadership coach, author and speaker, and passionate animal lover, horse lover, dog lover, and um, really set these interviews up to help anybody who's going through the reinvention process or thinking about going through the reinvention process to get some insights from folks who have already been through it a few times or maybe currently go undergoing a reinvention of sorts. And I would say, actually, now we're, we're recording this during the pandemic, everyone is reinventing. So we're all making these little shifts and trying to figure out and navigate the, the, the new normal, the new paradigm, whatever you call it, uh, just get a footing and move forward. So today we have this wonderful guest here and I'm so honored to have my good friend Marianne Clyde with us today. So I am going to read your bio, Marianne, because it is so spectacular. I don't want to miss a thing. So here we go. Speaking to businesses and community groups about empowerment, team building, and relationship health, Marianne has practiced as a mar marriage and family therapist for almost 30 years before retiring at the beginning of 2019. Congratulations on that. She is an energizing speaker and dauntless world traveler, for sure. She has written three best-selling books, numerous articles in newspapers and magazines like Bustle and Entrepreneur, and appeared on radio and TV addressing topics ranging from school shootings to having a happy marriage. Founder of the Be The Change Foundation, training and equipping women to be entrepreneurs, Marianne is involved in various philanthropic endeavors, such as the local food assembly program, generosity feeds for kids who are hunger challenge in our own community. And you've been doing that a long time. Yeah. About most five years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And most recently, listen to this, you guys. She trekked to Mount Everest Base Camp in Nepal with World Hope International to raise money and awareness about the need for clean water around the world. In 2017, she was voted Best Therapist in, War in Warrington and Business Person of the Year by the Fakir Chamber of Commerce. She's been named Northern Virginian of the Year in 2018 by Northern Virginian Magazine. She is a mom and stepmom to eight adult children and grandma to 17. <laughs> She's the chair elect of the Fauquier Chamber of Commerce for 2021, and she lives in Rappahannock County with her husband and two labs, Mojo and Pepper. Welcome, 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 Marianne. So great to see you. Thank you, Sherry. What a privilege to be with you. I mean, every day is a privilege to be with you, but this is particular, so thank you. Uh, you're very kind, and, and really, I'm so excited for you to share some of your insights, your wisdom with folks this morning. So I want to just jump right in. Um, tell us what you're doing now. You know, what, about, what are you doing now? What's, what's uh, emerging for you, and what's your current focus? And then we'll backtrack a little bit. Okay, well, I'm, I'm reinventing. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Great. On a whole bunch of different levels. I've, I've been retired from my paying business for uh, about a year and a half. And, um, and some of the things that I've gotten involved in in the last, you know, four or five years, um, like uh, the Be the Change Foundation, is finding that we have to reinvent because in the spring we had to cancel our midway we had to cancel our series of classes because we were no longer allowed to meet in person and we were not prepared to jump online so, so like so many people expertly did i was not an expert at that still am not an expert at that but um and so that is going through a reinvention on we're developing fabulous new online program so it won't matter if there's COVID or not COVID, we can sustain ourselves and expand our reach, which I'm really excited about. And then um, I've been on the board of the Fauquier Chamber for probably five years, something like that. And, and now I'm geared up to be the chairman for next year. And so the chamber has had to make some 
pivots and reinventions because we we can't meet in person and our our signature is um, networking and providing opportunities for people to get together and learn new things and and it always seems to revolve around lunch or dinner or breakfast or food I mean that's just the American way and so um, we can't have not been able to do that for the last five months so we're in a pivot there too is how can we um, reach our members benefit our members um, and and I just happen to be in this position of course, I don't know how I got here, but right in this position, right before the new year of having to come up with a new way of doing things. And so um, that in itself is exciting because, you know, sometimes, um, and I know you and I have talked about that and, and uh, it, it reinvention, things happen and create an opportunity for change. So we have to stop looking at things like, this is a terrible thing, this is a disaster, this is awful, things have to change. Somebody has to say, well, it's not the way it was, so we need, what are we gonna do? That's, that's the question I like to ask myself, as you do, is, so what are you gonna do about that? And so I'm in the middle of that big question in a couple of areas. Yeah, thank you. You know, it's it's interesting for to hear about your retirement last year, and you don't sound like the typical retired person. <laughs> Was this a plan for you after you sold your your um, therapy practice? You know, what what was what was your vision for what's next? Because it sounds like you're super busy. Is is this what it was? I mean, barring the pandemic, of course. But you know, what, what was that like for you, retirement? Well, I actually love retirement, but the, the absolute truth is I've sort of been retired and on vacation my whole life because I feel like I, feel like I do what I want when I want. I enjoy being um, home with my dogs and my husband and I, um, you know, we've got a beautiful property where I can spend time at the pond and in the pool and walking through the woods and meditating and all, all the things I love to do. I'm, I'm an introvert. Um, so, so walking through the woods is like really exciting for me. And, um, and yet at the same time, I love to reach out and help people. And um, I just need to recharge at home by myself. So what I retired from was making money. So how's that grab you? Yeah, that's such a great, it's such a great um, way of defining it. I mean, that's, that's retirement in a totally different sense. You retired from making money, but you didn't retire from being fully engaged. It sounds like you've been fully engaged in your life the whole time. It wasn't like retirement was like, now I'm going to live. You know, you've been living by your own design. It sounds like mo most of your life. Well, that's right. And, and the truth is, if I wasn't retired, you know, you, you get to, to your mid 60s and it's kind of like, well, what do I do now? And, um, and as soon as right after my 65th birthday, I, um, this opportunity to work with a really reputable organization like World Hope International um, to raise money for clean water around the world. And I've traveled with them for 20 years or so. Um, and they do really good work. I, I just only sort of half heard the other half of that raise money for water thing. And it was, you just have to climb Mount Everest Space Camp. For some reason, that didn't register when I said yes. <laughs> but I would never have been allowed or I wouldn't have had the time to do it if I had a full load of clients. Because I, it took, you know, for an aging body, it takes uh, a lot of preparation, <laughs> a lot of hiking, a lot of working out, training figuring out how not to die, you know, those kinds of things. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So tell us about that. I mean, how do you, how, what drives you to be able to, to do those rigorous workouts and get yourself in top shape so that you can do the climb and you, you, you summited, right? I mean, you got to the base camp. I got to the base camp, but I didn't summit. Yeah. That was, right, yeah. That was another, what, 20, <laughs> I don't know another 10,000 feet or something like that. But no, I was, um, we, we went to 17,600 feet and it was a, you know, a long way to go before you get to the summit. But for me, it was really, really a challenge. And, and I'm pretty good at 
getting a vision and doing the preparations and completing that vision. Not quite as good with the um, perpetual mundane, oh, I have to do this every year for the rest of my life, or I have to, um, you know, so I don't like to be bored. I'm probably a little ADHD or, or something. I can be focused for a certain amount of time. And so even, even with um, my, my counseling practices, I've, I've had to reinvent those, I don't know how many times, because my husband's job caused him to move a lot. So I would, but I could jump right into it and know that there's a need and do it in San Diego and do it in Boston and do it in Japan and do it in um, the Washington DC area. And you just, and, and probably that's good for me because it was like, you know, if I stay too long, maybe I get in a rut, God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really amazing. So it sounds like you're, you're very aware of your own process, you know, the process that works for you. You may, you may not even have conscious awareness of it, but there is a, a process that you're following. And I'm curious to hear, you know, what you think about that. What, you mentioned the vision piece and then you know being able to follow these specific tactics but then there's the the you showing up you know we talk about who you are so mm -hmm. who do you have to be to do these things and how do you what motivates you to be able to chart that course and then implement it take that action and get yourself into the get yourself to achieve the goal well you know sherry i think for the um the first thing i have to remember is that being resentful and angry and and short-sighted and selfish all the that doesn't help and so i have been in those places many times like i don't want to move again no i'm just digging my heels in here the kids are just getting ready for school you know and and so i've i've had times of of uh real long boring yucky talks with myself is like, I don't want to be here. I've been here before. Why can't we just stay in one place? And uh, I've had those talks with my husband as well. So, um, but he, but he's very, uh, he understands me. And, and I've come to the place where I, I know I'm not powerful. I'm not loving. I'm not effective. I'm not helpful to other people if I don't deal with my own stuff. I mean, it's part of being a therapist. You, you cannot be unhealthy in your thought processes and be an effective sounding board for clients. You just can't. I mean, there might be a lot of people that do that, but for, but for me, it doesn't work. And, um, and so you sort of have to learn to walk your talk and get out of your own way. And, um, and a little bit by little bit, I've been learning that over the years. It's not like I have been doing that forever. That's for sure. So what, what helps you get out of your own way? I mean, what are some of the practices? You mentioned the self-talk and having these, these long conversations with yourself. What other kinds of um, tactics do you use on yourself to, to reframe and refocus and continue to move forward? Great question. I, I really do, I, I, I have a pretty strong spiritual base. Mm -hmm. And of course it's, it's grown and merged and morphed over the years and so forth. But I feel like I have a really strong connection with God, which is like one of the first principles of all my books is connect with your creator. Because if I don't do that, if I don't ground myself on a, on a regular basis with, um, with God or, or whatever, however you see him, I see him as God, the creator. And, and, and if I'm really connected to him, then I'm one with him and I'm like him or I should be. And um, so if, if he is love and joy and peace and creativity and moving forward and wise and insightful and caring, and I'm sitting here going, rah, 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 I don't want to be here. Then, then that's not who I'm being. And I know it's not in my best interest or anyone else's best interest. It's not even 
physically healthy so you don't look as good you don't feel as good you 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 don't have as much energy and so over the years i've learned to to make decisions based on paying really really close attention because that's also the, the third point that i make in my my 10 principles of living is i nurture awareness and i know that's one of your probably your first principle in in your reinvention process is you you have to be aware not only what's happening around you but what's happening probably even more importantly inside of you because what's happening inside of you is what you're going to project to the world and if you're feeling vengeful rejecting like you want to curl up and disappear that's exactly what you're presenting to the world and that's the results you're going to get you're you're going to disconnect from people you're going to disappear from their um radar and you're not going to be effective and i do believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that each one of us has a calling to to be the difference be the change in this world and that that's why we're here and i can't be the change or a good change anyway if i'm grumpy all the time so beautifully stated you know i i, I really the the faith part really resonates with me and even this morning you know i was in this kind of funky state and i had different issues with the horses and different things and and allowed myself the pity party and we've talked about that a little bit in the past um and and then i was able to to go out i had some had a fly spray one of my horses and i went out and it was just what you were talking about it was almost as if noble my horse i could see god through his eyes you know he he had this beautiful almost aura light within him and you know he's his own special being but he came to me and i felt a complete shift of like this is what's possible this is the light be that you know and he was so embracing of that that i couldn't hold on to any negativity in the presence of of that being i just dropped it oh. so it was um so i i feel what you're saying so so prominently right now because it just it just happened an hour or two ago um so thank you for that and i love what you said that everyone has a calling what would you say is your calling you know i don't even know if if i i i can put it into words i do believe i'm here to love other people to help them see themselves in the best possible light i i think one of my gifts is encouragement um and motivation and and so so i guess uh so i guess it's just to to help others love themselves and see themselves through through the eyes of the creator just like just like every little child is is adored and loved and cute and and fun to watch and and I believe that's how God sees us. And, um, and, and that's how I want, I actually am, am and, and this isn't, this I believe everybody is, is God's ears and eyes and bodies on this planet. Um, we're, the, we're the hands and feet and mouths of God. And, and so, if I sort of let him come in through the back and speak out through my mouth the encouragement to other people and, and see them and tell them how I see them and how I believe he sees them, then it's, it's sort of, and that's, that's how I did therapy for so many years is I would just kind of sit and kind of listen to the client with one ear and listen to what I believe the spirit was saying in the other ear and then let an observation um, come out through my mouth. And, you know, sometimes it's a little better than others. <laughs> so beautiful. So when you're, when now, as you're moving forward with Be The Change Foundation and as the board chair of the Fakir Chamber, 
what what um, challenges and opportunities are you seeing as you place your calling within this context now, those two contexts? Okay, well, well, one of the reasons where I found to be the Change Foundation was to help women provide for their families, help women to approach making money in an entrepreneurial way so that um, they, they can mold them, their, themselves around the lives that they need to have currently, whether it's with kids or with family or no kids or, or whatever they want to do. That, but life is flexible. And I really do think the trend these days is toward entrepreneurial businesses, toward people running their own lives in a way that works for them. I, I think a lot of the millennials and, and things like that, they're not interested in, in nine to five jobs. You know, They're not interested in sitting behind a desk and not being involved and not having their opinion heard. And, um, and a lot of times for many, many years, you know, we've got, we've been like people in gray suits, you know, living, living the, 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 the industrialized dream. Not that that was a bad thing, but I don't think people, I never wanted to be that. I never wanted to do that. And, and I don't think um, the generations coming up behind us have any interest in that whatsoever, at least as a general rule. And so now I've got a position there. Also, the younger people are so much more adept to um, technology than I ever am. You know, it's always like I'm dancing as fast as I can just to know how to post something on Facebook. And, and then they leave Facebook and they go to Instagram. And, and it's like, I don't know how to do Instagram, you know. So, so this opportunity gives of change. And the same thing for the chamber, because a lot of them are, are, are just like me and my age and so forth. And, and kind of stuck in, in old ways of thinking. Not that those old ways were bad, but that they're just not updated, shall we say. And so um, it gives us a chance in both settings, be the change and, and with the, the chamber, to say, to, to look around for people who really know technology, really understand different ways of thinking. Um, how do you make money? And, and still meet on Zoom. How do you make money without creating a 5,000 person event to have a, a fundraiser, you know, and, um, and there are ways to do it. And so we're, we're looking to, to engage people who know this stuff. So we have to number one, be humble and admit where we're weak in our knowledge base and I think people, entrepreneurs particularly, need to surround themselves with people who know more than they do and, um, and be willing to learn and be curious and, and um, yeah, and be humble about it and just say, whoa, teach me. I don't know. I don't have an idea. Do you have an idea? You know, and, and, um, and just make it a learning experience. Great. Yeah. You're right. The whole humility piece, you know, to be humble enough to be, have that beginner mindset. You know, that's, that's where a lot of us are. And that's where a lot of the opportunity is, even within the expertise that we already hold, you know, having that beginner mindset. Love that, that you say that. So for you, what's been one of your, you have so many amazing things that you've done in your life and that you've achieved. What, what's one of your proudest moments? I think my proudest moments are having my children. You know, those, those are, um, we have a great family with some really spectacular kids. Um, they're, I think my youngest are, are gonna be 38 this year and then, and then they go up into almost 50. And so it's, it's kind of a little scary because how did that happen, right? And, um, and so, it's, it's, it's a, uh, kids are really, are, I think spending time and 
nurturing our kids and encouraging our kids and using our gifts in the lives of our children is huge. And, and if we don't have children, we find other people to inspire and to encourage and to um, train as they're, as they're wanting to be trained. And so, yeah, for the first thing, of course, it's, it's the kids. But I, you know, some of the fun stuff I've done, like jumping out of an airplane and, and climbing up to Mount Everest, you know, th those things were terrifying. And yet at the same time, really, really stimulating. And there's always running a marathon. I did that too. And I'm not a runner, so go figure that out. You know, so it's, it's um, you learn something when you do something you're not really prepared to do. You, you not just, it's not just a physical thing, which is really, really good, but it's, it's uh, there, there's things about business I learned. You know, like, like um, for the jumping out of an airplane, you can't fly if you don't jump. You know, you just, if, you don't, if you don't reinvent yourself, you're not going to change. If, if you, you know, climbing Mount Everest, you know, yeah, we've all got our mountains to climb and it's hard, but the views are spectacular and the ecosystems we walked through were so varied from like a big, big jungle and, and warm and sweaty one day to, um, you know, walking across on rivers on little stones that are covered with ice, you know, it's a little shaky. <laughs> and, and you just learn that life is tenuous and exciting and fabulous and beautiful all at the same time. And, um, and those are just life lessons I learned that helped me help other people. And so I'm, I don't know if I'm going to be doing another one of those anytime soon, but it was fun when, it, when I did it. So incredibly awesome and inspiring. So there's your next book, right? You Can't Fly If You Don't Jump. What's Perfect that? Title. You Can't Fly If You Don't Jump. Your next book. <laughs> I've already written an article or two about that, so maybe I just need to expand it a little bit. Good suggestion. Yeah, yep. Put all that stuff about the, the climb, the whole thing. You got it. I mean, I can't wait to read it. <laughs> So I have a couple more questions for you about, I mean, I could talk to you all day because you're just fascinating. How do you get over, or, well, let me just ask you this because I'm assuming, I'm assuming that you might feel fear. I'm not seeing any evidence of that, but it, do you feel fear? And if you do, what do you, how do you get over it? Because this is some scary stuff, jumping out of planes and climbing mountains and, and establishing new practices all over the world. You don't know anybody. I mean, what, how do you deal with that? cry. <laughs> I, just, I, mean, I remember one time I was, I was on Everest. I have a fear of heights. So, so, you know, go figure that, you know, so I remember one time we were going on a tiny little um, path. It must have been no more than 12 or 18 feet, uh, inches wide on the side of a mountain where the mountain goes up on one side and the mountain goes down on the other side. And, and I found myself kind of hyperventilating. Um, and, and it was like, I had to do what we talked about earlier. A lot of self-talk is like thousands of people do this every year and they don't die. You know, that kind of, let's get to business, you know? And so, so I do a lot of self-talk. I, my mantra is, is step four in my, um, in my books and, and my 10 essential principles for life and it's just just breathe but you know when you're at whatever it was that particular day 14 15,000 feet that's not as easy as as you'd think you know so here I am hyperventilating can't breathe in kind of really slow really anyway so what I did when we finally got through that little passageway is I just kind of shed a few tears and thought yikes and again, the self-talk comes in and you can't turn around because I'm not doing that again. And, um, you know, so you just sort of, you have a few things that you do to get out of the fear and, um, and you practice those things in the moment. You take deep breaths, you slow your thinking, you change your self-talk to what you would say to somebody you were trying to calm down. And so 
those simple things are, are ways that I get over um, fear, you know, and in the middle of the night, when I'm kind of wake up at two o'clock in the morning with, oh my gosh, what are we going to do about this? What am I going to do about that? Again, you do the breathing, you get up, you walk around, you, you um, maybe sit and meditate, and then you calm yourself down enough to slow down. Sometimes you even have to get a cup of herbal tea or whatever and just really um, recognize that fear is a, a human reaction. And it's so normal, but it's really not helpful to let yourself stay there. Um, so, so not to condemn yourself for feeling that fear, but, but to understand that this is not... This is not my best moment. This is not helping me. This is not helping anybody else. This is not helping me get sleep for Pete's sake. And this is not helping me get by this little pathway on the mountain. It's just like, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, be compassionate, but move forward. One little tiny steps. I love, I love the movie, What About Bob? You know, where he wrote a whole book called Baby Steps. Baby Steps. That's all you have to do. Wow. So cool. Love all of that. So what advice would you give to folks who are right on the brink of reinventing, or maybe they, they're considering reinventing, or maybe they've started the reinvention process and eh, maybe it's going a little sideways or they think it's going sideways. What advice would you give to folks in, in the reinvention space? The truth is, we have a mindset that's, oh my God, what if I fail? And, and, and the idea is, you know, that's, that's a failure is a perception. Yes, you may lose money. Yes, you may um, tick somebody off and, and um, get some bad feedback or um, have people be judging you, you know, but the fact of the matter is you're, if you're curious and you're learning, you know, go back to that little child that's learning to walk. You know, if they start to stumble, um, and they fall on their face, which happens a lot, you know, around 18 months or two years, you know, it's just, they fall a lot, but you don't sit there and say, what are you thinking? What are you doing? What, can't you do that yet? I mean, we do do that to our children sometimes. We should never do that to our kids because it takes us learning over and over and over in order to plant something in our psyche. Um, and remember, God sees us as a beautiful, learning, curious child full of, uh, full of promise and, and possibilities. And, and we need to learn to see ourselves that way and be quick to forgive, slow to judge, and and really really quick to come in with mercy to ourselves before we can do it with anybody else and and so yeah but remind me that I said this stuff so that the next time I call you complaining that oh my gosh this is gonna go, this is gonna go haywire and you can you can just play me that right back okay because that is what you are excellent at one of the many things you are excellent at is refocus and getting somebody to say, yeah, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. Tell me this. And you're very good at getting somebody refocused. And I appreciate that. You've done it to me many times. Well, so thank I'll call you for you that. I'll call you tomorrow. <laughs> Well, thank you. And that's a, such, such good advice for folks. So they shouldn't just give up, right? Just keep taking the baby steps, right? One foot in front of the other. And like you said, just keep showing up. You know, the Marx Brothers knew that for Pete's sake, you know, just show up. Just show up. Oh, that's fabulous. Well, Marianne, I could talk with you all day long, every day. It would just fascinate me. And I, I love listening to you. I don't get to listen to you too much because you're such a good listener that you're always asking questions of other people. So it's been really fun to actually be able to have you in the hot seat here and kind of get some ideas on from you yourself and your incredible background. So where can what's the best way for folks to reach you now? I know your books are all on Amazon, so I will have some links to that in the in the recording. But what's the best way for folks to reach out and find you? Actually, 
actually the best, the only website I actually have going at the moment is bethechangefoundation.us. That's where we find out about that um, and, and what we're doing there. Um, and let me see, I guess that's, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook. And, um, and so, so there's, you know, Google me, I'm there. Google, Google. Yeah. First, <laughs> yes, you do. You show up. First page, Google. <laughs> and I have a YouTube channel called Zentivity.tv. And ah, um, it has perfect. a lot of the videos that I've done over the years and so forth. And I've got a video account, which has some great interviews of you on there. <laughs> oh boy, from the archives. <laughs> what color is her hair that month? <laughs> oh, thanks, Mary. Well, what we'll do is put the links in the video here so um, folks can, can reach out and, and contact you and get as inspired as I am every time we have a conversation. So, um, Anything else that you'd like to, to share with folks? I, um, some parting words, anything else? I think, I think that if, if we can just help people believe in themselves, understand that there really are no unchangeable mistakes that we can make. We just have to reinvent, pivot, turn, make a change. I mean, at any moment, you can change your thoughts and the thoughts are what drive the direction of the steps that you take. So as soon as you recognize that you've got some haywire thinking going on in your brain, like, oh my God, I'm not good enough, or this is, I'm failing, I'm failing, you know, just turn it around and say, nope, you're not failing. You just discovered another way not to do that. And, and what can we do now? And ask yourself, what can I do about that? And if you can't do anything, then stop condemning yourself. But almost always there's something you can do to turn things around. And a lot of it is self-talk and changing your thinking. Beautiful. Oh, you're so inspiring. I, mean, I feel so empowered, you know, <laughs> like all ready to get off and go take charge and, and do something new. <laughs> So thank you for that. You, you're an inspiration to me and always have been ever since I've known you. And we've known each other, what, 10, 11 years? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. It's, it's been a long time. And, and, and I knew immediately when I first met you, I was like, I need to get to know that person more. She's awesome. And that was before I really knew how awesome you were. <laughs> well, thank you for asking me. This was a lot of fun. And I really do appreciate yes. you. Oh. Well, thanks, Mary. It's been a great honor, and um, thank you all for watching, folks who tuned in, and um, so grateful to be able to bring you these incredible people. And Marianne, thank you so much, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day, and best of luck on this on these new ventures that you have. Folks are so lucky to have you so fully engaged and committed uh, during your retirement. <laughs> Air quotes. <laughs> What's in the world? Right. <laughs> Bye for now, everybody. <laughs>